How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet, chapter 52, verse 7, of the mountains, the feet of who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who brings glad tidings and good things, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Let's go to chapter 53. And in verse, the last verse of uh, 2 says, He has no form, comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him striken, smitten by God and afflicted, that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? He, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Or stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich of his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. Don't you love that? My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear the iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he has numbered his trans with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Wow. All of that. All of that is just talking about the Messiah, Jesus. Complete wholeness. Complete wholeness at the work of that cross. Not only is he cleans us from our sin, he brings peace in our hearts and peace towards God and myself. There is peace between you and God. And also there is healing. By his stripes, we are healed. Amen. Didn't you wonder why? I mean, all the others that died on the cross, they just died on the cross. 
They were, they were uh, like Jesus after all those things. But it was those stripes that because of those stripes, we are healed. It was part of the plan. It was already there. Christ suffered all. Christ suffered all. God is not weak because he has his son. You know, so th there is another religion that thinks Jesus existed by the only the time when comes upon Mary. No. And they call Mary the mother of God. Mary is not the mother of God. Mary is a beautiful teenage girl who loved the Lord. And God chose her. God just happened to chose her because he knew she would say, yes, use me, Lord. He knew she would yield to God's will. It wasn't easy for a teenage girl in that time to be a single mom pregnant. She could have been um, stoned to death. But she said yes. And the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and suddenly she was with child. But the most beautiful, precious child. And imagine growing there. Imagine the God, Jesus himself, God's work, who created the universe with his father, growing as a little weak baby. And then having to wait 30 years to fulfill the mission that he had to do. But at 12, he couldn't help himself. <laughs> he was in the temple preaching. Don't you know I need to be about my father's business? Oh, he loved his father. But he had to wait until he was 30 for the promise to fulfill everything the word said. And 30 years old, a grown-up man goes into those waters in the river of Jordan being baptized by John the Baptist. And the Holy Spirit coming upon him. And that's where his ministry started. That was the divine. That was the suddenly and immediately. Beautiful. 30 years waited. And you and me. We have to wait as well. We have victory in Christ. Our victory is assured. We are more than conquerors. Amen. God always leads us into triumph. Always. Always. But there may be one specific task that God designed us to do. That only you can do. And it's not just. For the Benny Hins of this world, of Reinhard Bonkit, of Pastor Steve Mel, but for everyone that God calls. He puts an a specific task. Some people call destiny. I don't really like that word. I like the destination. Jesus, my destination. But there is something that God has put in your heart and in my heart. That only us can do. Only you can do. And like. Like Joseph had to wait. And like David. For the moment he was anointed king of Israel. As a teenager again. I mean God loves teenagers. God loves young people. Beautiful. How many of you were called when you were a teenager? Lift up your hand, don't be shy. Teenagers. <laughs> God redeems the time. It doesn't matter your age. But it's so beautiful when a young person doesn't have to wait along the way for things to happen to turn to God. And as a teenager, he was prophesied, King David, he will be the king of Israel. How long until he became the king? How long? 
Joseph, all these dreams. How long until he became the prime minister of Egypt? How long? How long Jesus had to wait until his ministry was public? Well, you and me, we don't know. We don't know. But we do know that for the one specific thing God has called us. He had called us with a holy calling. He has appointed us. Amen. It is a holy calling. And it's beautiful. And may, we may not even know. We may not even have the dreams and the, uh, the prophet coming and prophesying and pouring oil all over us. We may not have had all of that. What a beautiful promise. Blessed are those that without sin still believe. Beautiful. But I've, I haven't seen God's face. But I have seen his works. And it's seeing him at work that showed me he is real. He is real. Going to a slum in the middle of India. The work that he does in our hearts is supernatural that we can't explain. It's just beautiful. But going with my husband in the middle of a slum in India where there is no streets. So we go as far as we can with the bus and then we park it somewhere and then we just have to walk through there. Where they told us there is a little congregation, only a few of Christians to go and encourage them. And we went, I mean, the intention to go to India was to do a big campaign in Hyderabad. But because there were, there were wars and things and, uh, happening, uh, they was canceled. But we were there, so we stay in, in that time it was called Bombay, which now is Mumbai. And then God started opening up contacts. And then so we went to encourage these few little Christians, and they kept apologizing the whole way. There is only a few of them. We said, don't worry, we are here. It's okay. And then when we're walking through there, <laughs> people are looking at us. They know we are foreigners. So they start following us. Children, mothers, fathers. There's no other entertainment in there. So let's see what these strange foreigners are going to do. These pansies from New York. <laughs> if you watch kids' movies. Anyway, so we were <laughs> through there. By the time we got to the little place, it was full of people. I mean, it was as big as this place. And thank God that one of the walls was missing. <laughs> George, we need you there. <laughs> one of the walls was missing. So it became like a stage. And here was all these people having very close fellowship. <laughs> it was overwhelming to see that. Wow. Then we, how many believe in Jesus? Nobody believes in Jesus. And my husband said, I'm going to show you Jesus is the only God. I'm going to show you Jesus is the true God. How many of you have sickness in your body? And he mentioned 10 different sicknesses and things, conditions, 10 different ones. 25 people lift up their hands. They identify having that. So they came to the little front area, these 25 people. And then Pastor Steve makes a prayer. He does not touch anyone. He just makes a prayer. And before he says, amen, people are on the ground, poo, 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 falling down. The 25 of them. And we're like, ah. 
when they get up, and that's what we'll say, you know, we, we're helping them up and say, what happened? They are all healed. And they all jump in and say, I'm healed, I'm healed. <laughs> and after that, I'm telling you, they wasn't preaching or anything. It was just simply that. I say, now how many of you want to receive Jesus as your God? Everybody. <laughs> Everybody in the place received Jesus that day. Wow. That changed my life forever. When I was in Uruguay, again with my husband, and they told us the campaigns over there, they tried to do joining churches and do a big campaign, but it never has worked because after the third day, Something will happen on the third night and they had to cancel everything. So he says, we have scheduled it for a week, but this is what we are letting you know that I don't know what, there's a lot of witchcraft and macumba and a lot of things happening. Um, this is Uruguay, very, uh, you know, close to Brazil and, and our Argentina. And so this is what we have in, in, the, in the center, in, in the town. Okay. Praise God. So we go. First night, beautiful. Loads of people. 5,000. So many people. Beautiful. Miracle, salvation. Second night, same. Still full of people, salvations, healing. Beautiful. Third night comes. And my third day comes, and my husband wakes up with no voice. He had no calls, he had nothing. And this is what they say, at the third day, something happened, and the preachers don't have voices. So he wakes up, and no voice at all. Nothing. So they're saying, they're panicking, shall we cancel? And my husband's saying, no, we're not canceling. We go to the night. We are standing there, you know, the platform, uh, on the side of the platform. I'm next to my husband. And I can see he has no voice. And the meeting already started. The praise and worship already finished. And my husband still has no voice. And they present him. Now evangelist Steve Mel, he walks up those steps, he takes the microphone, and his voice comes out. Yeah. You believe that? Then there were big hailstones like that. It's summertime, no rain or anything, big hailstones started to come. But it didn't stop us. And we continue the seven night. After that, we found out in the newspapers were saying there was a baby was sacrificed on the beach by these Macumba people trying to stop the meetings. But they didn't succeed. They didn't succeed. Because the God that we serve is a God that is powerful. But in that come, amen. Yes, Jesus. But the most amazing thing that impacted me in that campaign, it, it was just so beautiful to see people coming to the front with the dogs and everything, just receiving Christ. Um, it was lovely. But they were, <laughs> yes, amen. That was for Jesus. Okay. Um, but they, one of the uh, big miracles, because after the campaign, we will go to the radio station and, my, and they will do programs and people will be calling and telling their testimonies and stuff of what the campaign was doing. Because it was, it was big. It was big in the radio and the news. And, and it was this man going on a bus with a gun in his pocket, wanting to end his life. But when he saw the crowd, he said, what are these people doing? A bunch of crazy people. Let me go and see what they're doing. And it's when he heard the, heard the gospel and gave his life to Christ. We didn't know anything about this. 
until later on, it was about one or two in the morning, this is at radio programs, he calls to the radio crying, saying that thank God he has found Jesus. He was going to end his life, but he had found Jesus. And he, had, he was full of joy. I mean, he couldn't even speak on the phone. He was crying and crying and crying. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. The, the God that we serve is a God that is alive. He's at work. And he's the same God today here in England. In what for? And Niasi mentioned, we look at the natural and it says one thing. But we were not called to look at the natural. We were called to look upon Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Amen. He's our hope. He's our strength. He's the power that carries us on. And I don't know how long it may take for you to come to what God has appointed you to come. But it will surely come. It will surely come. Are we going to be ready? Are we going to be ready? Or are we going to give up and get discouraged? Or are we going to get tired? Let's be on fire for God. Let's be on fire. Like yesterday I was talking to a couple of guys who said they were Christians. So I said, don't know why I asked this question. Are you saying, are you on fire for God? And they say, yeah. And I said, how? <laughs> I don't know why I asked the question. <laughs> how are you on fire? Well, we, they kind of didn't know how to answer. But they said, yeah, we do our bits and pieces here and there. Okay, I said, but you know what, guys, you have to make sure we are on fire. What does it mean on fire? People have gone into our websites and have seen a church on fire. And they're thinking, what's on fire? <laughs> Jesus is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus is the one who baptizes and sets us on fire. The moment we say, yes, Jesus... Holy Spirit, fill us. Holy Spirit, possess me. We always hear about possessed by, by other spirits. We want to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. When we are possessed by the Holy Spirit, we say things that we say, why did I say that thing? Because it's not me. It is the Holy Spirit speaking through me, through you. How many times you say things and I say, I don't know why I said that. I found a man one day walking along uh, uh, the shopping mall with a woman. I didn't know. I, I haven't met his wife. And, and he was holding hands with this woman. But I never met his wife. And apparently all I heard is the wife was a bit, mm, didn't want to know anything. So I see the man holding hands with this woman. So I go to him and I was so happy. And I said, great, because the woman that he's holding hands with, I know that woman. So if that woman is your wife, then great, because we're friends here. <laughs> oops, big oops. <laughs> because that was not his wife. But you know what? I said things that I'm thinking, why am I saying this thing? Why am I right here, right now? But it was the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. And that man had to repent and leave that relationship. I don't know who, what he has done since then. I pray, Lord, take hold of his life. Take hold of his life. But it was a lesson for me, knowing that when we let the Holy Spirit use us. He does. He does. And we say things and we say, why am I saying this? This must be the Holy Spirit. I had a dream and I'm finishing soon. I had a dream when I'm sitting around a, a little table and I'm talking to these three people, but I'm not talking 
very ele eloquent, like normal, you know. I never do talk eloquent. <laughs> Sometimes I try to be posh in text, but anyway. <laughs> but this, in my dream, I'm even more like really like a dumb person, like, you know, like, um, Jesus loves you and trying to preach the gospel to them. But I'm really thinking like, you're not doing a good job, are you? Look at that, say it properly, speak properly. And I kind of, ugh. but I only managed to say a few words. And these three people start to cry and cried and cried. And I'm thinking, what's happening? I hardly told them anything. I hardly said anything. Where, why are they crying? And then I said, can I pray for you to lead you to Jesus? Yes, they're saying. And they're crying and crying. And I'm thinking, wow, this is truly you, Lord. This is truly you doing the work because I haven't said anything. <coughs> that was my dream. I liked that dream. But this week, something happened to this old man that I put the notification in my Facebook because, and I kept sharing the testimony. I think it was the third or fourth or fifth time that I shared it, that it clicked on me. This was just like my dream. I'm speaking to the man, and the first thing I said to him, do you know Jesus loves you? And he said, ha, <laughs> like really like, yeah, ha, ha. I don't know all the interpretation you can get of that. But for me, it's like, Shh, don't want nothing to do with Jesus. And I said, is it funny that Jesus loves you? Why do you laugh? What is funny about it? Why am I saying this? <laughs> and he said, well, because he had it stick let me sit down before I fall down and you can continue talking to me I say okay and so he sits down and say okay <laughs> and I like the dream again um, <laughs> Jesus loves you he paid the price and we all seen us we're not perfect but God sent his only son and all these things that I'm trying to think of but not doing a very good job and then he starts crying. And he starts crying. And I'm thinking, what should I do next? What do I need to say? What do I, Lord, what am I doing? Can I pray for you? Yes, he said. And he looks around and I said, don't worry about the people around you. Oh, no, he said. Okay. <laughs> and so I made the prayer and I said, Dear God, which I never say, dear God. Dear God, said, dear God, thank you for sending your son to die in my place. And he says, thank you for sending. And he was meaning everything he was saying. And tears flowing down his face. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. We come to Christ. And we think we know everything. We read a few verses and we think we know it. But let's not be proud. We are thankful for God's word. We are thankful for the wisdom he gives us. But we don't know anything. He does it. And he uses us. He puts the words in our mouth. He goes exactly and speaks exactly what the person needs. And every time I go out to witness, I have to remember that these are the people he died for. 
these are the people he loved. We don't go out to say, we have found the truth. What are you stupid people? Don't you get it? But the Bible tell us, tells us, plead with them. Second Corinthians 5. 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to him through Jesus Christ. So all things are of God. All things are of God. It is his power. It is his anointing. It is his love. Out of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God were pleading through us. Can you see that? As though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. That's all we need to do. Believe with people to be reconciled with God. For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the God that we serve with his own blood. He paid the price to reconcile us to Christ. You and me become the righteousness of God. Because his blood has made me clean. It was his sacrifice that made me clean. That made you clean. So don't keep going back to the vomit. Don't keep going and admiring what the world has to offer you. God has made you clean. He has reconciled you to God. Jesus has reconciled you to God. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. It's so precious. I finished telling those two young people about the verse in Revelation. That I'd rather you to be hot or cold, cold or hot, and not lukewarm. Otherwise, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's what the word of God says. It is not good enough now to be a nice Christian and to do my little bit for Christ. It is not good enough. God wants completely surrender. The Holy Spirit wants to completely possess you. He wants you to live 100% for him. On fire. On fire for him. That is what Jesus is saying. You know those parable of the ten virgins. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Because the foolish ones were Christians. But they weren't taking it seriously. They were Christians. They were still waiting for Jesus, for the bride to come, for the bridegroom to come, for the husband to come. They were there ready in their own eyes. I don't trust what I think is to be a good Christian. I trust what the Bible says. I don't trust doctrines of men or traditions of men. I trust what Jesus said in his Bible. I am God's righteousness because he has cleansed me. I am. 
But I also need to work my salvation with fear and trembling. That we should no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us. That is what to, is to be on fire for God. Let his fire burn within us. Lord, this is what I like to do in my day, my routine. But I, no longer I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what do you want me to do? Yes. Seek him. Let's stand up, please. And we'll pray for, for the people watching right now. Extend your hands to the, to the camera there. We pray blessing upon the people watching fire. If they are Christians, let them be on fire for God in Jesus' name. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit come upon those Christians. And if those who do not know Christ, Father, we pray for encounters with you in Jesus' name. Let repentance come and touch their lives and they acknowledge you as Jesus and receive you in their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.